Welcome everyone. We are live with a new episode of Level Up Law. Every Tuesday at noon, South Carolina Legal Services levels up your legal knowledge about an area of law that we practice in. And we are delighted to bring you today's episode on estate planning and administration. I am staff attorney Holly Webster, and I will be your host today for Level Up Law. I'm here with Level Up Law producer Kenneth Elliott from our IT department, who is making sure everything is running properly for us today. You are viewing live our staff attorney and elder probate unit head, Corey Strain, from our Charleston office, who will be sharing information on the ins and outs of estate planning and administration in South Carolina. But before that, we always want to remind you that the information in this video is not legal advice. It's just general information for the public, but it's important information. If you need the help of a lawyer, call our intake line here at South Carolina Legal Services or apply online. That information will be provided for you at the end of today's presentation. Also, as a reminder, all of our episodes are posted by our producer, Kenneth Elliott, to the Level Up Law playlist on our YouTube channel, usually within 24 hours. For today, Corey can answer general questions if there is time at the conclusion of today's presentation. Just put any questions you have in the question box. So let's get started. Corey? Good afternoon. My name is Corey Strain. I'm an attorney in the Charleston Office of South Carolina Legal Services. And today I'm going to go over some basic overview of the state administration, some potential issues, and estate planning documents that can help you avoid some potential issues. So just to start off, South Carolina Legal Services is a nonprofit law firm. So we help people with civil legal issues who cannot afford private attorneys and a wide variety of civil legal issues. Uh, we don't do anything involving criminal law. We don't do criminal defense. The uh, closest we get there is we can sometimes help with expungements. And we don't do torts or personal injury type cases. And there may be some limitations if it's what we call fee generating case. Um, it's not really important that you determine that yourself if you apply for services we will determine if that's something we can do and what level of service we can provide we are a statewide law firm so we have nine offices around the state it serves every county throughout south carolina and we can help individuals who are not south carolina residents if they have a case that is in south carolina so if you're a defendant um, or involved in an action that's been filed in one of our counties we can assist you as well we do have income-based qualifications and our general funding can go up to 200% um, federal poverty level if we ask for a waiver. But we do have some asset limits just if you have too much cash or money readily available or might have limits where we'll be able to help you because our funders consider that to be something that would enable you to afford a private attorney. This chart does give you an idea of what the income limits would be for our normal grant. Um, but this is the 2023 year, so that federal poverty level is adjusted every year, and the amount reflected here is not going to be the current numbers. Anyone who does qualify for services, though, does not pay attorney's fees to attorneys at South Carolina Legal Services. That is free. However, there might be some costs, depending on the type of case, that we are not able to pay for you. So although we don't charge attorney's fees, there could still be some expenses with your case that you would have to cover. Examples would be court filing fees if they can't be waived, <clears throat> any costs that are required or ordered by the court, if there are a guardian ad litem that needs to be appointed, those fees, as well as service fees if service can't be done um, without a fee. That can be waived in some cases, but not at all, it depends on how service needs to be accomplished in there. If you do need to apply for services, there are multiple ways you can apply. You can apply by phone by calling our intake office, which is 1-888-346-5592. That number is open Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. It can be a little busy sometimes, so if you're placed on poll and the call disconnects, that just means there were too many other calls, they weren't able to get to you. Just call back until you get through. However, if you're having a hard time getting through by phone, you can also apply online uh, by going to our website at www.lawhelp.org. You'll see a 
a banner at the uh, top for applying online. It's, it's fairly large. And the last option is if you have an emergency, your case is time sensitive, you have a deadline, you've already been served, something like that, you can go to your local office and tell the receptionist that you have an emergency and we do emergency intakes in person. I will also do those for individuals who do not have phone or internet access. So if you go to apply in person, make sure you do tell the receptionist or the staff you speak with that you have an emergency case, you have a deadline, or that you don't have phone or internet access so they know they're supposed to do an intake in person since that's not our normal method. Now that's just going over. Once again, we do have limits. We can't do criminal cases or fee generating cases. That's when you know insurance fees can be paid by the other side as part of the relief based on a contract or statute. And once again, this is just a disclaimer. This presentation is for information only. It is not designed to replace representation by an attorney on your specific legal issue. This is general information. Um, it's not to be relied on as representation by an attorney. If you are having issues with the state administration or planning, it is best that you apply for an attorney and have an attorney look into the particulars of your actual case because there may be some unique circumstances that are not going to be addressed uh, by a broad general information session such as this. So today I'm going to go over a brief summary of probate administration and some potential issues that can happen in administration as well as some types and uses for estate planning. So some documents and choices you can make to avoid uh, potential issues in estate administration and just planning in general. So to start off, it's important to know for estate administration, what happens if you don't have legal documents in place, your estate is going to be considered intestate. Intestate is just a legal term describing someone who has passed without a last will and living testament, or last will and testament, which is commonly just called a will. Um, last will and testament is just a good way to clarify because there is another document that has a similar name, which is entirely different. If you've ever heard the term a living will, that is an entirely different document that's not regarding your distribution of property and assets uh, upon your passing. Um, that is going to be for your choices on what happens with things such as life support and feeding tubes. So they're similar names, but different last will and testament or just will um, should be referring to your estate planning documents. That's going to be your choices on what happens after you have passed to your property. So intestate is when you don't have a last will and testament. It is a default and it's going to be based on where you live. So when I discuss intestate law in this presentation, it's based on South Carolina law. So that's for individuals whose estates are being administered in South Carolina, which is usually going to occur because it's where you resided when you passed. However, there could also be administration in other states if you have property in multiple states. Uh, so sometimes you have estates open just because you have real estate land that is in that state. If you have real estate in multiple states, you could have to go through multiple state proceedings and multiple states laws may apply for each particular piece of land. It's going to be controlled by the state where that land is located. Um, and the way to kind of resolve some of those slight differences or discrepancies and simplify the process would be to have a will. So you can make your choices clear and have the property pass as you wish instead of leaving it up to the state default choices, um, especially if you have multi-state property, because like I said, that might not even be the same inheritance process uh, for every state. It does vary from state to state. Additionally, there are some other benefits we'll get to a little later. So what is a will? A will is a legal document that names the people you want to leave property to and what property you want them to receive after you have passed. So the people who are receiving in your will are going to be known as beneficiaries or devisees. Uh, that's just the term for it. And the property would be everything you own at the time of your passing. So that could include land or your home or other real property you own, uh, cars, money in a bank account, uh, insurance policies if they're payable to an estate, shares of stocks, your personal belongings such as jewelry, household contents, um, collections, and it would include intellectual property you own. 
Now it's important to remember that is going to be things that you still own at the time of your death. There are ways of owning property where it'll bypass probate. So it's important you understand what property you have and how you own it. Uh, one common example of something that would not be probate property, although it could be, is your land. Depending on how you own it, it may not actually go through your estate. It's become more and more common, especially for couples or co-owners of land, to have their home with a joint tenant right of survivorship instead of just tenants in common. If you are listed as the individuals receiving land, the uh, grantees, and it says two names or multiple names, joint tenants with right of survivorship or something very similar to that, that would be a situation where it's not probate property, your will wouldn't control it because the right of survivorship occurs automatically upon your passing where one owner passes, their interest would automatically go to the surviving owners, um, which is very clear when it's only two people, the sole surviving owner would then automatically be the owner of that piece of property, regardless of what the will of the other owner said. The will would not control, because that's not owned by you at your death, it has already passed under the right of survivorship. Additionally, if you have insurance policies or um, some retirement accounts, you ha might have named beneficiaries in them, if you have named a specific individual as a beneficiary, that is going to go to them through the document that controls that policy or account. Um, it would not go through your estate unless you didn't have any beneficiary named or if you had designated it payable to your estate. You'd have to look at those documents to see what choices you made when those were prepared. And it's very important to be aware of the choices you made there, especially if you've named beneficiaries if you've named a minor child to receive it, you need to talk with the institution the account is with and make sure you've made elections on who is going to be in charge of that money and the account or policy payout if the minor child inherits while they're still a minor. So if something were to happen to you before they become an adult, you should be able to make elections in your planning documents for those policies or accounts where you designate an adult who can receive the money and manage it until the person you are actually leaving to your minor beneficiary becomes an adult. It's a good idea to do that in the planning documents instead of waiting because if you have a life insurance policy payable to an estate, or excuse me, payable to a minor, and you pass, and now that money is needed for the care of the minor, it's not going to be paid out directly to the minor in those situations, and it might require a whole another court case or legal action just to free up access to that resource until the minor became an adult. If they needed it sooner, they might have to follow something like a conservatorship. Uh, that's an example of a, a type of case that even if someone qualified for our services, it's not free. There are going to be court costs with a conservatorship, and that can be avoided by just designating someone to manage the money um, under your policy if it is being left to a minor. So if it's a possible situation, you have a minor who may receive please do review those documents and contact the institution that is in control of the policy and make sure you have done those elections. They may not have gone through that with you in a lot of detail if you didn't ask them the questions about it. So please review that and make those choices now to save your loved ones a lot of difficulty and potential heartache in the future. So this slide here is actually just showing you what the intestate statute looks like. Um, it's a lot and it can get a little daunting depending on your specific situation. This is just to show you why it's important that you do make a will. Um, it's a lot of text and for most people it's not going to be as complicated. And in fact, sometimes how you want your property to pass may be the same as the intestate choices. To simplify it, it's stating that if you have a surviving spouse and descendants, so if you have children, and grandchildren, etc., then 50% of the property would go to your surviving spouse. The other 50% would be divided amongst your descendants. If you have descendants and no spouse, it is all divided equally amongst your descendants. If you are married and have no descendants, it all goes to your spouse. It gets a little more complicated when you have no spouse and no children, uh, because then it's going to go up to your parents if your parents were alive. If not, then it goes down to the parents' descendants. And it's going to essentially go up and down throughout blood relations, not um, step relations. So it's going to be people who are actually your biological relatives until someone is found who would inherit at the first level that would inherit. 
Um, it gets more complicated if your parents have passed, it's getting down to siblings, or if all of your siblings have passed, your siblings' descendants. Depending on how big your family is and how many people have already passed, it can get more complicated. Um, additionally, it could result in multiple people receiving property, which leads to something known as heirs' property. Uh, heirs' property is when you're going to have co-owners who are heirs, their family members, owning property together. It's usually um, an issue for land. That's typically where you're going to hear it. And in most cases, the traditional sense, it's going to be when the property was left in someone's name who passed, no estate administration occurred, so the property is still just sitting in the name of a deceased individual, and it's never been updated. So the owner of record is someone who has passed possibly generations ago. Um, that can cause issues for notice if some legal action happens involving the land, like if taxes aren't paid, there's a tax sale. It can also create issues if the heirs no longer agree on the use of the land, if there's some dispute, uh, because it's not clear who is known and who is not. That can become complicated. It can make it harder to sell. And uh, over, at some point, it will ultimately result in a situation where there's too many people to actually use the land. So not all of the owners would even have the benefit of the land they do own. That is quite a problem, and it can be prevented by going through estate administration for individuals who have passed, and ideally having estate planning documents in place so you limit the number of co-owners and keep it at a, a feasible level where people are going to be able to work together and get along, or ideally, for simplicity's sake, if it is owned by one person, that prevents potential issues with tax benefits and if case there's an emergency, documents need to be signed for repairs or uh, another situation. If something happens and one of the owners, the person living there needs to sell the property and move due to some life circumstance or event, they're going to have the ability to do that much more clearly if it's only one person versus multiple because um, then you don't have to reach a consensus and have everyone sign. If you really need to take action, you're able to. So it can be quite a benefit. So for a will to be valid in South Carolina, it's really not a very strict requirement. The will does have to be in writing, uh, so you can't have a verbal will. It has to be signed in witness. So you should have two witnesses. Um, the witnesses shouldn't be individuals receiving in the will, and they shouldn't be relatives of yourself or someone receiving in the will, just to prevent potential issues if someone were to challenge it. Technically, if the individuals or the witnesses are named in the will, it doesn't necessarily invalidate the entire will, uh, but it's not a good idea because it would preclude them from receiving in the sections where they were named. So best practice, don't have anyone who's going to receive or be a relative acting as a witness. Um, additionally, it's not a strict legal requirement, but this is one reason you should have an attorney because you can add more to a will than these basic requirements. A uh, big one's going to be a self-proving affidavit or section in there, which is going to require the will to be notarized and just have certain language in it that if it is there, it's self-proving. The court will receive it and they don't have to contact the witnesses or anything. They will see that it meets the basic formal requirements here. And because it is notarized and has a, a small clause at the end, that it can be accepted as is without reaching out to those witnesses and verifying that they did in fact witness the will. It's very helpful. It makes it a lot easier. An attorney would also be able to explain all the different parties in a will and if you have made choices that could cause a problem they can have that conversation with you and spot potential issues um, that's going to be too much for me to explain every potential issue you may have but they'll do things such as is the person you're naming as your personal representative and that's an individual you choose to be in charge of the actual estate administration they're going to handle the property while it's being probated they're going to have to fill out all the paperwork and interact with the probate board they'll have to start the estate um, are they an individual who's going to be capable of doing it? And is there really a reason for them to do it? Generally, I wouldn't recommend appointing someone as the personal representative of your estate in your will, unless they were going to actually receive something out of the will. It just doesn't make sense to have someone go through that and do all the work with no benefit to themselves, because there's no reason for them personally to take that initiative and go through the work. And it can be a bit of work. Most estates are what we call informal. And informal just means the estate can be administered without a hearing. Um, so most of them are, it's paperwork driven, but it is quite a bit of paperwork and it can be a lot, especially for an individual who's never dealt with it. And if they don't have an attorney, it can be a little overwhelming for them. Uh, additionally, it is quite a long commitment. The estate process, if 
the estate is open timely shortly after someone has passed, uh, essentially less than a year from their passing, it, it's gonna take a while. It typically takes a year, maybe a little longer from the state. If it's opened right away, it will take at least eight months um, because there is something called a creditor claim period. That's where creditors can file a claim with your estate if they claim you owed them money, um, still at the time of your passing. Because if you have debts, while your heirs don't inherit your debt, they're not gonna be financially responsible for paying debts you personally owed that they were not a party to. Um, creditors that you owed would still be entitled to receive out of your estate property before you can give it away to someone else. Um, so your loved ones aren't going to have to pay your bills, but you can't give them money in a bank account you had if you didn't pay your debts first. The individuals who are entitled to be paid on debts would be able to file a claim and get paid before the property is distributed. So as you notice, there's not a lot of strict requirements for a will in South Carolina. It is fairly simple. It can be done without an attorney. You can't prepare it yourself. Um, there is no requirement to have a lawyer involved at all. However, I would still recommend everyone seeking to have a will prepared, at least consult with an attorney, if not have an attorney prepare the document for you, because an attorney is gonna be able to make sure it is worded to accomplish what you want, um, that you're not putting anything in your will that would not be enforceable. They'll be able to discuss issues that may come up with your will, such as if you were naming a beneficiary who was a minor, um, they would be able to tell you the steps to take to avoid problems where you leave property or money to a minor, depending on the type of property and the amount. Uh, they'd also be able to have a conversation with you about if you're leaving property to someone who has a disability and might be on public benefits, that is something they need to know and they discuss with you uh, to avoid giving someone property in a way that would make them ineligible for public benefits, which may be their only source of income. Uh, that's very important if you're leaving property to someone who receives SSI, uh, so they're receiving Social Security benefits only because they're disabled, particularly if it's SSI, which is the program for individuals who are disabled and are not working enough to be insured, the equivalent where you have a work history and you've paid into the Social Security Administration for other individuals called SSDI um, or Title II benefits, if you want the technical term, that's a separate program. That one's an insurance policy based on your work history. You've earned that. It's based on how much you paid into the system. So you're getting a higher payment under the SSDI potentially, and you won't have all of the income limits or asset limits that you might run into with SSI, which are people who are never able to work enough to be insured. Um, it's much, much more important to consider with SSI. It could cause more problems and make them ineligible especially if you're leaving them assets with multiple people. The details of that can be a little complex. So I'm not going to go into that other than to warn you, if you have loved ones who receive those benefits, do make sure you consult with an attorney and plan for that. So some of the potential issues with the state administration, as I was going over a little bit, are one for yourself. If you don't have an attorney discuss it with you, not every direction you put in a will is guaranteed to occur. Some people will put property, like especially land, that's usually a big one that causes problems. They want to leave it to someone, but then put a lot of additional limitations or exceptions into what they can do with it. If you prepare your will yourself, there's a high chance that's going to be considered a restraint against alienation. That's a legal term. Uh, you don't need to remember the term itself, other than what it means is certain limitations you put in the will will not be enforceable. The law doesn't really favor preventing people from using land because of things that have happened from previous owners who are now deceased. Um, there's a large history in that. Um, honestly, it even goes back to before the United States was founded as a country, back when we were colonies, and just the political systems that were in place there. People tried to limit the passing of land to prevent other people from gaining rights, such as the right to participate politically, to vote. Um, they caused a lot of problems like that, where wealthy people at one point essentially try to keep their families in power and limit other people from gaining rights that came with land ownership. That's some of the history into it. Um, but it's just against public policy. We don't want to have a bunch of land that the people alone can't actually enjoy. That's generally frowned upon. It's not great to have land where it's not being used in the way which would make the owners and public in general the most happy. We want people to be able to enjoy the things they have. <clears throat> 
another reason to consult with an attorney is when you do your estate planning, it's important to remember that that is based on your wishes and your life situation at the time you prepare the document. And sometimes you're going to have events in your life occur that will change what you would want to happen to your property. So you might need to update your estate planning documents. It's not always going to be a one-off where you do it once and you never change it. Generally, you will have things occur that will change how you want to leave your property and who you want to receive what. And the best way to do that is to consult with an attorney so they can tell you if you need a new will or not and the best way to amend it or if it's to the point where you're better off just doing an entirely new will. Um, there can be a lot of issues if you try to do something called a codicil, which is a way of changing portions or part of your existing will. Um, you have to be very careful how you draft that. It still has to be signed the same way with you, know, you doing it in writing, having it witnessed. Um, additionally, the language becomes very important there to clarify what sections you're changing and what you're not changing and trying to avoid potential conflicts where it's unclear what should happen based on the situation at the time of your passing. Uh, even bigger issue is there could be issues for your loved ones based on how you leave property in your will or if you don't have a will. If you don't have it and it's inherited by someone, um, such as if you have multiple children, so you have multiple descendants, they're going to inherit things together. They're going to technically have all their names on any piece of land you receive or a vehicle. Um, that can quickly cause problems because it's one, just difficult to co-own certain things you can't share amongst each other, which is not going to be feasible or practical. Um, so that creates a potential headache and then someone's going to have to force it to be sold. If one person doesn't want it to be sold, that can potentially cause problems where suddenly you're not doing informal probate. It's not just paperwork and filling out forms. You might have to have a hearing and there can be various expenses with that, such as one, the filing fee, just to start formal probate where you request a hearing. Normally they charge you $150 for that. Um, two, if you have to have a hearing, the probate courts generally do not provide a court report for you. You have to obtain one and pay them whatever their rates are going to be for the hearing. That can quickly become quite expensive, especially for individuals who are low income. So people typically qualify for our services. That can quickly add up to a lot of money that can make it kind of cost prohibitive to probate estates. So you normally want to avoid that by having clear choices and your will and talking with an attorney to avoid potential problems like that. Another common issue is if you leave property to your children and you currently have children who are under the age of 18, they're still minors, or if you're leaving property to someone who has had a disability or illness that makes them legally incapacitated, they're not capable of signing documents or managing property on their own, those are situations where you need a will because once it has been left to them, that property needs to be managed or transferred. It wouldn't necessarily be possible for them to just do that automatically by themselves. One, if they're a minor, they legally don't have the ability to transfer or actually control the property yet. Their guardian would have to, and in some situations, many, they would have to apply for a conservatorship, which as I mentioned previously, can be quite expensive and it's a whole other legal case or process. Um, so if you didn't plan for that, you didn't nominate someone to hold it for them in a contingent trust, uh, then they have to essentially do that same thing. But through the courts, it's going to take more time, cost more money, and it's quite a headache, especially if the individual you're trying to leave the property to doesn't have a lot of money to start with because they normally have to pay that on the front end to then get the property where they can control. Um, maybe they'll be able to use the assets in the estate to pay that. It just depends. Is it a liquid asset like money or is it land? Additionally, like I said, if someone's receiving SSI, are they going to receive property because you didn't have a will and they are a co-owner of it and suddenly that's an asset that's counted and makes them ineligible for SSI benefits? That's not something you want to put on them. They have to go through the Social Security Administration potentially and show that it shouldn't be counted as an asset, even though the rules say it initially is unless some exception applies. Um, the Social Security Administration appeals process can be very long and quite difficult. That agency has a lot of cases. Um, they have a lot of issues where they have delays, and it's just very difficult for anyone, even an attorney sometimes, to deal with the agency, let alone an individual who may not have an attorney and has a dis disability, which may make it more difficult for them uh, to handle that process themselves. So it's an important thing to consider, discuss with an attorney, and make sure you plan for specifically to avoid those problems. Name someone to manage the property for minors or incapacitated people. Uh, minors, it's usually going to be called a contingent trust. 
for someone who's incapacitated, you might need to have a more detailed will where you have something like a supplemental needs trust, um, also sometimes referred to as a special needs trust. That's a way of leaving the property for their benefit, but naming someone who will control the property and it's technically owned by a trust. That's a bit complicated, so it's too much to explain at a level where you'd be able to understand here. That's just to let you know of potential issues and things you might need to ask an attorney to do for you. An attorney will be able to spot those issues for you and prepare it in a way where it sets those things in place. They can have that specific conversation after determining what property you have, who you want to leave that property to, and who would potentially receive it if you didn't have the time to talk in place. Another issue that can come up if you prepare your will, uh, marriage and divorce can have an effect on your will. Um, or if you don't have a will, it also matters. So it's important to note, as I said earlier, when you pass, if you are legally married, your spouse will get half of the estate, your descendants will get the other half, or if you don't have descendants, your spouse will get the entire estate. That's going to be based on if you are legally married. So if you have separated from someone you were legally married to, um, you're no longer in contact with them, you're no longer acting with spouses, you still are legally married. They still will be entitled to your estate until you get a divorce. It's important to note, even if you do prepare a will, your legal spouse can receive part of the estate. They could always request what they call an elective share. They won't get necessarily the half or a full amount they would if you didn't have a will, but they can ask for at least one third, even if you name them to receive nothing or you gave them less than a third. They can still file that elective share and try to get one third of your estate. Um, so that can cause problems if you remain legally married and you're estranged from your spouse and you don't take legal action to finalize a divorce. Additionally, if you get a divorce and you had a will, um, divorce will not invalidate your entire will. However, when you get a divorce, it will remove your former spouse from election. So if you had named your spouse to receive something and then you get a divorce, it's going to nullify that choice and then go to the person essentially you had named as an alternative if your spouse didn't survive you. It should invalidate any elections where you nominated your spouse to receive property, <clears throat> but it does not revoke your entire will. But it is a situation which shows, okay, your life circumstances have changed. You should probably prepare a new will if you get a divorce. And if you have a will and you didn't leave anything to your legal spouse who you're estranged from, you may need to look into getting a divorce legally because that would avoid them from still receiving if that's something you don't want to happen. Um, additionally, it'll come up again on one of the next planning documents I'm going to discuss, and I'll mention that when we get to it. Okay, another planning document other than just doing a will, um, this one won't really affect a state administration, a power of attorney. A durable power of attorney is a document you can prepare to appoint someone to essentially act on your behalf. It's usually used for financial purposes, so one of the main common ones is so if something were to happen to you where you couldn't access your bank or make your own payments on your bills, you're in a car accident, you're comatose, um, you have an injury that prevents you from understanding or communicating, if that were to occur, a power of attorney is a document you can have in place that will let someone just go ahead and act on your behalf. They can access your bank account, they can sign documents for you, they can make payments, withdrawals, deposits. Um, it generally will give them the ability to act in your place, it just won't give them the ability to do self-dealing, gift them stuff, give away your property for free, unless you specifically chose to allow some of those things, which you can do, but generally would not be advisable. So it's a useful document if you're going to be visiting overseas for a long period of time and someone might need to manage accounts while you're absent and you can't. It's a good thing to have in place regardless of any such plans like that, just in case you were to be in an accident or suffer some sudden illness because then you would have someone who can continue taking care of your property that you chose and it's much quicker and cheaper than the other ways of handling that if you were to suddenly lose capacity um, so this is once again just an example of some things uh power of attorney or agent is going to be the term for the person you appoint through a power of attorney they can do things like deal with your bank account transfer money pay your bills um deal with any shares or stocks buy or sell real estate collect income, government benefits, um, they can deal with your, your other accounts, like your insurance, your um, health accounts, anything like that. They can really stand in your place in general. And when they can start acting does depend on how you draft the document. 
this is once again it's a document you can't prepare without an attorney but it's a good idea to have an attorney prepare it because they'll be able to talk to you about when it becomes effective and the benefits and cons of that most power of attorneys are going to be effective immediately so even before you lose capacity once you sign it the person you named as your agent can act on your behalf and start doing these things which is why it's very important you choose someone who's responsible and you trust and be comfortable allowing to have that level of control and access over your assets and property um, they need to be financially responsible and someone you trust don't choose someone you don't trust but most of them are going to be effective automatically and continue to be effective even if you were to be in an accident and lose legal capacity until some court order comes through terminating it or until you have passed this is why it doesn't affect the state administration once you have passed away your power of attorney will cease to have an effect your agent cannot act on your behalf when you are deceased their authority has ended because your life has ended um, it's only for the duration of your life so if you don't have a power of attorney in place and you were to lose capacity um, suddenly you wouldn't have someone in place who could access your accounts to sign documents like financial documents um, for any of your assets or accounts those things would be kind of in limbo they would not interact with your family members or loved ones usually um, other than if you have something like a mortgage they'll take money from them if they continue to pay it but if you run into a problem or it falls behind on payments because they didn't make the initial payment when the incident happened once you fall behind they might refuse to deal with your family members and only deal with the person named on the mortgage the account um that's the person they're going to file a case against so if you have the power of attorney in place they could show that to any of those agencies or institutions bank accounts and continue to act on your behalf um, if they don't have a power of attorney there is a legal process you can go through to do those same things uh, for someone to make choices for you but that's going to be a guardianship or conservatorship they're similar except a guardianship is a legal proceeding to have someone declared legally incapacitated which means they cannot understand or communicate responsible decisions doesn't mean someone doesn't make responsible decisions you can make bad choices and still have capacity that's a separate issue but if you couldn't understand or communicate that's when guardianship can be granted guardianship is more focused on your life choices where you live who you associate with things like that um it can also be for your care your health choices if you didn't have a health care power of attorney that's another document we mentioned uh, briefly in the future conservatorship is going to be specifically for your finances and assets but it's similar it's declaring someone legally incapacitated and picking the individual who will have the ability to make those choices or manage that property in their place um, it can be an individual or it can be an organization uh, guardianship more people will probably be appointed a guardian than would be a conservator just because with conservatorship they're also going to look into the credit worthiness of the individual filing and asking to be conservator courts may hesitate to appoint someone who has bad credit to manage your finances because that in their opinion creates a higher probability that they would misuse or mismanage your money because their credit reflects that they had issues with managing money for themselves personally um, so that's a potential issue the court may hesitate to appoint someone or they may put restrictions in place um, there's various things that can happen if you're running into that situation you really need to talk to an attorney it's not the quickest thing it can be a little difficult and it can be a bit expensive regardless of attorney's fees just through the normal court cost um, with guardianship conservatorship the court has to go through a process because it, it is taking away legal rights uh, so it has quite a profound effect on the person who is alleged to be incapacitated they'll lose those rights as long as that guardianship or conservatorship remains in place you have to file something to get it to end um, to get your rights back and so it, it can be quite serious and it's very very bad if it is misused you may have heard you know things in public media such as you know Britney Spears had a conservatorship that's a pretty big one you probably have heard about when there were issues where people are accused of misusing it there's been some local examples as well but it, it can be very serious when misused it can create a lot of problems because someone else has so much control and because of that the court especially in South Carolina does have a process involved it's a bit lengthy and they have to appoint people such as a guardian ad litem they have fees and those fees due to the seriousness of the case um, can add up quite quickly it can be a few thousand dollars even before you pay your attorney to do anything for you even if you did a pro se you could spend a few thousand dollars to get one of those things uh, finalized and if you had a power of attorney you could have taken care of that in advance and avoided the need to file that 
<clears throat> okay, this is just explaining capacity a little bit. So capacity is a spectrum. It depends on the exact document you're dealing with. Um, you do not have to have very high capacity to do a will. So someone can still do a last will testament, even if they have dementia, Alzheimer's, um, you know, some illness that could affect their ability to understand, as long as they're having a lucid moment when they're signing and preparing the will, uh, they just have to understand who would receive property, the objects of their affections, through their will, who receives them testate, and what they own. If they understand the property they own and the individuals receiving it, generally, they're going to be able to do a, a last one testament. It's a little higher as you get through the power of attorney documents because you have to understand the nature of the document and what it's doing its contractual capacity as to the extent of that contract, the power of attorney, the legal document. And the more complicated a legal document is, the higher the contractual capacity could be. Like I said, it's a spectrum. It depends. Um, that's one good reason to have an attorney prepare a document. They will be able to determine the capacity of the individual signing it who owns the document. And they can uh, also act as a potential witness if someone were to challenge that and claim you didn't have capacity. Sometimes attorneys have to participate in court cases as witnesses. We're called in and an attorney will say, well, here's my standard practice. Here's what I do. I do these questions and I make sure I determine capacity with the client alone. So no one else was doing the answers for them. If things get contested at a bad level, if an attorney prepared the document, there are potential witness who can make sure your document stands up and is not revoked. It is honored by the courts and other people who may challenge it will not be able to bypass. So to appoint an agent and the power of attorney, you'd have to sign the form appointing the chosen person, your agent, that's their title, for the title. And you may specify additional types of decisions they may or may not make. You can make it more or less broad, specific to your situation. Um, as I said earlier, they're typically effective immediately upon signing. That's what I would normally recommend. You can also have it only become effective if you were to lose capacity. Um, some people like that because they don't want someone to meddle with their affairs while they're fine and able to do so themselves, which I understand. However, my problem with power of attorneys that only become effective after you lose capacity is one, if you don't trust the individual you're appointing to handle your affairs while you're in good health and capable of monitoring and making those choices yourself, that's not a person you should appoint at all. If you don't trust them while you're healthy, you should not trust them when they're vulnerable. That's probably a bad choice to make. And two, if it only becomes effective upon you losing capacity before the person who needs to use it can use it, they would have to have enough documentation to satisfy the bank or the public agency they're trying to deal with that you have lost capacity. And you can specify how they do that in the document, but they still have to go through those steps. They might have to have a doctor examine you and write a statement. So that causes delays and potential costs if they have to pay the doctor to do that. And that kind of defeats the purpose of having the power of attorney in place in the first place. Suddenly it's not as quick. It's not as cheap. It's going to be more work and take longer to use. You know, one of the main benefits of the power of attorney is you have control over what happens when you lose capacity and it happens quickly automatically and it's not expensive um so like i said you get to choose who you can choose mostly anyone you can't choose a minor so the person you choose has to have capacity to understand their role they have to be an adult you can't appoint a minor to be in charge of you and it's not going to work um, but you don't have to choose who would normally be in charge it doesn't have to be your spouse it doesn't have to be your eldest child you can choose whoever you trust most to act on your behalf for that document, like financially for a, a durable power of attorney, the general one, that's what you want to do. Uh, additionally, to be durable and the cost of a power of attorney, it's not much. To make the power of attorney durable, you have to file it with the Register of Deeds in the county where you reside. The Register of Deeds currently charges $25 to register the power of attorney. So if you don't pay an attorney to draft it, it costs you $25. $25 to have someone in place that can continue to manage your affairs if something were to happen to you. That is very cheap and very simple when compared to a guardianship or conservatorship case, which could quickly end up costing thousands of dollars, even for a relatively non-contested estate. So to revoke or change a power of attorney, um, you can just notify your agent that you are revoking it. If you report it in the Register of Deeds, I do recommend you take additional steps. Um, you should destroy the original if you still have it. Um, you can file a written revocation 
in the register of deeds, they'll charge another $25 for that, but then at least it's on record. If anyone were to search your name at the register of deeds, they'll find the old power of attorney and then the revocation, the written document saying, I have revoked that. Um, you should also inform any of your banks or anyone who's dealt with your agent, just so they're aware, because once they're aware you've revoked it, they shouldn't rely upon it anymore. If you have an agent who's kind of gone rogue, they're acting out of place, um, while there could be legal consequences for them doing that, other individuals like your bank might um, honor that if they don't know you revoked it. So if the former agent comes forward to them, they have a copy of the power of attorney, it was recorded, and they try to make a, a withdrawal or deposit, the bank's not going to know you revoked it. They will honor it, and they're going to be legally protected the bank, not the agent, if the bank doesn't have reason to know it's revoked. So you notify your bank as well that you have revoked that, but no longer your agent. Or you could just do a new power of attorney. Um, your new power of attorney could have a clause in there revoking all previous ones and you record that. It has the same effect when you can then choose a new agent. So healthcare power of attorney is a similar document, but it's going to be limited to healthcare choices. Healthcare power of attorney will let someone make healthcare decisions on your behalf if you were to lose capacity. It will be limited to healthcare. There's also a living will I mentioned earlier. So like I said, a living will, um, sometimes also call it a declaration of a desire for natural death, allows you to make decisions regarding life-sustaining treatment, life support, feeding tube, and the event you were to become incapacitated so doctors know what you want to happen. The state template for a healthcare power of attorney in South Carolina does have the living will choices in it. So if you do a healthcare power of attorney here, you can make those choices as well. Um, so the decisions for healthcare are going to be to decide support services you engage in, to make medical appointments, to consent to medical treatments, in, including life sustaining treatments if you leave it up to your agent to decide. And those are some examples of that. And if you don't have a healthcare power of attorney, fortunately there is a law in place. So if you lose capacity, your healthcare can still be managed. Um, but the person who's going to be in charge is going to kind of go in this order. Um, so generally, unless you had a court appointed individual to make healthcare choices for you, it's going to be someone you named in a power of attorney. So if you had a durable power of attorney and not a healthcare, then your agent, the durable power of attorney, would be making healthcare choices as well under the Adult Healthcare Consent Act in South Carolina. If you didn't have an agent for a durable power of attorney or healthcare, it's usually going to be a spouse if you're married. Um, so that's another example. If you're legally married and estranged, you probably want to get a divorce because you may not want your estranged spouse making healthcare choices for you. Um, if not your spouse, then your adult children. So that's fine. That might be who you want, but it could quickly become a problem. If you have multiple children and they don't agree, the statute doesn't specify which child among them. It's not going to say the oldest gets the final say regardless. So something like that won't automatically happen. And quite frankly, the oldest child is not always going to be the one you want making healthcare choices for you. Um, after children, if you didn't have any children, it'd be your parents, or if your parents weren't around or able, it would be an adult sibling. If not, then they're going to go to grandparents, and that's usually where it's going to go. It can go further down to someone who is a blood relative or someone who's been providing your care. Um, when you get in those situations, it's probably good to have a healthcare power of attorney, though, because you can make it clear and simple who to contact and how. Um, the healthcare power of attorney template has their name, address, and phone number in it. So it's easy for your medical providers to access. Um, so the person you choose as an agent in the healthcare power of attorney, they need to be over the age of 18 and they should be willing to take on that responsibility um, and make sure it's someone you trust to make those medical choices for you. Have that conversation. I know it can be a little uncomfortable, but it's important you discuss your wishes with your family. Um, that way there's no confusion or disagreement or argument caused by not having that discussion. You don't want people to be surprised when they're already in a terrible situation because something has happened to their loved one with yourself. So when you're doing a healthcare power of attorney, it's important to discuss your HPOA with your family or your wishes. Talk to the person you want to name as your agent. Um, there is a template you can use the form online, or I would recommend having an attorney prepare the document for you, especially to qualify for services because we wouldn't charge for a healthcare power of attorney. It's a good thing to have in place. You can have the conversation, make sure you're making the proper choices. If you're doing it by yourself, make sure your form is properly witnessed and notarized, two witnesses not named in it, and make sure the notary does complete the notary section. And remember, you can choose which decisions your healthcare power of attorney makes, so plan those, make sure they're written in the document. If you want the living will choices, make those in it as well. If you don't, you can remove it, but those are good choices to make because it can 
relieve your loved ones from the pressure of making those choices for you. If you have a strong preference yourself, it's a lot easier if it comes from you versus one of your family members making that choice and trying to tell the others that's what they've decided to do and they were appointed. It's easier if it just comes directly from you. You can revoke a healthcare power of attorney as long as you still have capacity. So it's not as bad for healthcare power of attorney. You have to be able to understand the document and what it does, and then you can revoke it. You can destroy the original, do it in writing. Uh, for healthcare power of attorney, do notify any healthcare providers you have, especially ones that have received a copy of your original healthcare power of attorney that you have revoked it. So they're aware and they can update their file. Uh, there's not some master database for healthcare power of attorney. Just because one healthcare provider received it doesn't mean another's automatically going to have access to or see those records. You need to do it for every healthcare provider you interact with. That's just best practice. And that's a quick overview of some state of planning documents that can prevent potential issues and issues that you can run into through your state administration or if you do not have planning documents in place. So if there are any questions, I will address those now. And if you have questions that were not addressed in this presentation, I do encourage you to apply for services or contact another attorney if you do not qualify. Like I said, talking with an attorney about the details of your situation is much better than going off of general questions and answers because it will depend on your exact situation, the details of your issues. Um, there's not a cookie cutter response or solution for all individuals. And there do not appear to be any questions in the question box. So that concludes the presentation for today. I want to thank um, I want to thank you, Corey Strain, for uh, a terrific presentation. As always, we will post a recording of today's episode on our YouTube channel. Just look for the Level Up Law playlist on YouTube at South Carolina Legal Services. Now, when you go to our YouTube channel, share the video if you find it helpful, and think and think it may be helpful to others. While you're there, you can also subscribe to our channel and sign up for notifications, so you'll know every time we post a new video. Now check this out. We want you to scan this QR code and let us know what subjects you would like us to discuss on upcoming episodes of Level Up Law. Also, be sure to check us out on social media and get all the up-to-date information we provide on Level Up Law and also get informa important information as well as links to our other resources. Those websites and social media handles are on your screen right now. And we have that QR code where you can sign up for our newsletter. We want as many people as possible to get this important information. They may not need it, but they probably know someone who does. And be sure to tune in next week where we will observe Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Our special guest will be Christine Curry, Program Director for Asian American Pacific Islanders at the South Carolina Commission on Minority Affairs. Thanks again, Corey and Producer Kenneth, and thanks to you, our audience, for tuning in on Level Up Law. That concludes today's webinar.